come on in, pull up a chair, take a load off, because today I will be paging through and reviewing the Call of Cthulhu 7th edition Keeper Rulebook from Chaosium Inc. So is this pretty much the ultimate Keeper's Guide for Call of Cthulhu? Or is it just kind of a spit shine polish job on an old system that didn't need a new edition? Well, you're going to find out right after this. Howdy, 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 gang. Yes, I'm Jeff McAleer, back once again as your host here at the Gaming Gang channel. As I mentioned in the open, we are going to page through and I am going to review the Keeper rulebook for 7th edition Call of Cthulhu in just a moment. But I do want to remind you, if you like this video, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel if you haven't. And if you do subscribe, ring that notification bell because it will not only let you know when I upload videos such as this, it will also tell you when my live show the Daily Dope airs Monday through Thursday nights right here on YouTube. Of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more. As mentioned in the open, we are going to be diving deeply into the Keeper Rulebook for 7th edition Call of Cthulhu from Chaosium Inc. Game is written by Sandy Peterson, Mike Mason, Paul Fricker, Lynn Willis, and friends. Those mysterious friends. This 448 page hardcover is available for $54.95. You can get it as part of the slipcase set, which includes the investigator handbook and the Keeper screen, which is how I received it from my friends at Chaosium to do this review. That is available for $129, and I believe it's 99 cents. You can get the Keeper rulebook in soft cover for $44.95. I don't know why Chaosium does 95 cents on some, 99 cents on others. It's a little strange. Do you want to mention right now, as of this recording, the Keeper Rulebook is on sale in soft cover for $39.99. You can also grab the PDF over at Drive Through RPG for $27.95. And of course, whenever I mention Drive Through RPG, keep in mind the gaming gang is an affiliate of Drive Through. So if you are going to go visit Drive Through RPG, please stop by at thegaminggang.com first. Click on one of our little banner ads, and that way, if you happen to make a purchase, I get a little portion of that sale. And all those little pieces, all those nickels and dimes, really do add up and help keep the gaming gang around. Right, so without further ado, let's swing on over to the other camera, because, ta-da, there is the Call of Cthulhu Keeper Rulebook in all its glory. Flip on over to the other side here, take a look at the back. I'm not gonna read everything here, but Call of Cthulhu is a tabletop role-playing game based upon the worlds of H.P. Lovecraft. It is a game of secrets, mysteries, and horror. Playing the role of steadfast investigators, you travel to strange and dangerous places, uncover false plots. <laughs> it's like, what, slots? No, it's <laughs> uncover false plots and stand against the terrors of the Cthulhu mythos. You encounter sanity-blasting entities, monsters, and insane cultists. Within strange and forgotten tomes of lore, you discover revelations that man was not meant to know. You and your companions may very well decide the fate of the world. This book, the Keeper Rulebook, contains the core rules, background, guidance, spells, and monsters of the game. It is intended for use by the Keeper of Arcane Lore, otherwise known as the Keeper, that player who will present the adventure to the other players. 
You must have at least one copy of this book to play Call of Cthulhu. The other players, the investigators, should have one or more copies of the Investigator Handbook, which I have recently reviewed as well. That contains expanded rules for character creation, skills, occupations, equipment, and more. And importantly, Call of Cthulhu 7th Edition is backwards compatible with all other available Chaosium titles. So that is something important to keep in mind. Let's crack this on open. We are looking at 448 pages. So I'm going to try to flip through this at a relatively brisk pace. And I will kind of discuss uh, some of the key mechanics of Call of Cthulhu. So as I mentioned on the back, if you want to play C of C, as we've always referred to it, because I've been running this since it came out in 1981. I know a lot of people call it COC. We always just call it C of C. But I gotta say, this is a beautiful book. This is a, an awesome looking book. I mentioned this when I did my review of the Investigator Handbook. I'll do my best to try to keep some of the glare off these pages, but these pages do have a finish to them. So they do pick up glare fairly easily from the lighting in here in the duct tape studios. But I mentioned it when I did my review of the Investigator Handbook that over the years, many of us who, who have played or run Call of Cthulhu, usually it's the keeper who's going to own the, these books like this. We always looked lovingly at the foreign language editions that were just gorgeous with full color art and just amazing production. And we got black and white line art in the uh, American or North American English language editions from Chaosium, which was fine. But I gotta say, I love the fact that for the first time, we get an all color, full color presentation here with Call of Cthulhu. And I love it, just love it. So we get a little bit of an introduction here. If you're not familiar with Call of Cthulhu, gotta be honest, I don't know why you're even watching this video. You have to have some idea what it's about. It is a game based on the Cthulhu mythos created by H.P. Lovecraft and other authors. There are other authors' uh, creations that are covered in Call of Cthulhu. Not necessarily all in this book, but uh, they have appeared. So August Derleth is an example. Look at that awesome artwork. Love it. Love it. So it is a game of investigating, and it is a game of mysterious plots and horror. So we're going to get into a little discussion about Howard Phillips Lovecraft here. Do want to mention he is a polarizing figure. Of course, he's been dead since, uh, if memory serves me correctly, 1936. But he was not the uh, most open-minded person in the world, and some of, especially his earlier stories will reflect that. I got to say, as far as my understanding, and this, this comes from some uh, Lovecraft expert, he did uh, kind of become much more open-minded, a lot less racist as he got older. So I know a lot of people just, you know, you, you try to separate the work from the person. It's kind of difficult to do. Doesn't strike me as the kind of person I would want to sit down and have a drink with. But many people enjoy his stories. I enjoy many of his stories. Not all of them, but a lot of them. So got to get that out of the way. Got to mention that because I know there are a lot of people out there who H.P. Lovecraft, well, you know, he's uh, not interested in the man himself, but they want to play the game. So this is going to talk about a little bit about uh, character creation. The investigator handbook really goes into details about the character generation, character creation. There is redundancy between the keeper rule book and the investigator handbook. I do want to point out there's not a ton. 
and it's a lot of it is mainly like here creating the investigators and it is verbatim just included in both books so we've got some sample occupations the investigator handbook has over 100 uh careers occupations for your characters do want to mention that this seventh edition and this has been out for a while in fact i originally did a review when chaosium was planning on releasing this as a single book and i did a review of that preview that came out and then the decision was made to to divide the core really into two books the investigator handbook as well as the keeper rule book and there is some influence in my opinion of fifth edition dungeons and dragons upon seventh edition call of cthulhu not a ton but a little bit and one of the aspects that is i i almost want to say foremost in this edition as we're taking a look at some of the skills various different skill list here a big part of that is the survivability of the player characters Call of Cthulhu for years, for decades. Remember, this game came out in 1981. For decades, it has been thought of by mainly by people who really haven't played it as a meat grinder. And it is true. Uh, these, these adventures are dangerous. And combat in Call of Cthulhu is very, very lethal. It is deadly. You're not walking around with 80 hit points. You're walking around with maybe a dozen. If you're lucky, maybe you've got 15 or 16 hit points. And it's pretty easy to be killed or incapacitated in Call of Cthulhu. So there has been uh, a change a little bit to make the character's survivability a bit higher. You're able to push your rolls. You're able to have advantage and disadvantage that is certainly something that when i think of advantage and disadvantage i automatically think of D. &D. Oh, i love that <laughs> i love that is so lovecraftian right there right they saved hitler's brain as far as the core mechanic of call of cthulhu it is a percentile based system now of course you will utilize other gaming dice you know your your d10s and 12s and 8s and 6s and 4s but for the most part you are mainly going to be rolling percentile dice and now we're going to kind of talk about the game system itself it's going to kind of explain it and before this edition and this is kind of how i break things down so before this edition you would have a skill and your skill might be, it's all percentile. It's from it's zero to 100. Well, you can't have 100. You can have 95. That's the highest. But you're going to roll percentile dice. And maybe the keeper gave you a, a bonus or a negative modifier to your die roll. And you're going to have to roll under your skill level. So let's say, as an example, I have an anthropology skill of 60, which is actually really good. And there's no modifiers. I would roll my percentile dice. And if I got 60 or less on my die roll, well, then I would succeed. And whatever success would mean for that skill, I get to learn. So as an example, maybe I'm trying to find something out about uh, an ancient culture that maybe we're exploring their ruins in a jungle and I'm trying to kind of piece things together and understand how that culture may have, have acted. Maybe, you know, did, did they sacrifice humans and things like that? You know, did they, did they offer sacrifices to their gods? Well, by successfully rolling my anthropology and probably spending some time kind of studying that site, I will get an opportunity to find out. Now, in 7th edition, Call of Cthulhu, we're looking at the same basic system, 
the percentile dice, but we also have difficulties. And I got to be very honest, I'm not necessarily really keen on the new difficulty levels. So essentially what you're looking at is if it's if it's something that's in fact, you know what? Well, we pop right back to here you go. So we got regular difficulty. We've got hard difficulty, which you're going to take your skill and and have it. So you're going to cut it in half. So if, if I had an anthropology skill of 60, but it's something that's hard difficulty, then it's going to drop down to 30. If it's extreme, then we're going to slice it even further. So you're looking at uh, cutting it down to, oh my gosh, now I can't remember right off the top of my head. It's a fifth. I was going to say 20% of your percentile. And then I'm like, but that may not make sense. So yeah, so it's a fifth of your skill. So as an example, I would have a 60. Well, now I get to take 20% of that, which would be 12 for an extreme difficulty. But if I fail, I can push my roll, which essentially means I can roll it again. I can try it again, but the stakes for failure get much higher. Also, with luck, luck is one of the attributes in Call of Cthulhu. With that, you're looking at, it's, it's once again, it's from one to uh, basically a hundred. And I can spend luck from my luck pool to succeed. So maybe if I, if I miss a roll by, let's say, five points, I could spend luck in order to succeed at that roll. So as opposed to previous editions of Call of Cthulhu, where you would just, yeah, if, if it was something difficult, maybe the keeper said, okay, it's uh, minus 20. The player rolls their dice. Now it's quite a bit different. Uh, previous editions, you roll your dice, success or failure. And then, you know, you lived with that die roll. Now in 7th edition, you have more opportunities to succeed at what you're trying to do. And that's what I'm, I mean when I say the survivability of the characters, of the player characters, has been increased. There is a supplement. It is Pulp Cthulhu. And it is for those out there who are looking for more of a kind of a pulp action kind of call Cthulhu. I'll be the first to admit that when I run Call of Cthulhu, I have a bit of a pulpy kind of vibe to it. There tends to be a little more action than you would normally expect from a call of, a traditional Call of Cthulhu adventure. I tend to like to throw cliffhangers in if it's going to be an adventure that's going to last more than one session, which I have run um, team campaigns in Call of Cthulhu. I always let the end a session on some sort of a cliffhanger. Come back next week. <laughs> so, uh, talking about attributes, uh, pretty similar attributes to most role-playing games. You've got your strength. You've got your con. You've got your intelligence. You've got education, which is uh, basically your book learning. Intelligence is just kind of natural intuitivity, I guess we'll say. We have size, which kind of just comes into play as far as hit points. Now, previous, it, it used to be a 3 to 18 range. And it was kind of funny because in previous editions, we also had resistance charts where, you know, if, if it's something against something else, you know, so it's, it's basically if you had uh, somebody drank poison, well, the poison would have a certain certain level, and then you'd use somebody's con skill, uh, I should say attribute, attribute. And then you would have to convert that into percentile, and then you're combining those two together, and it could be kind of confusing. So now what's happened is all those attributes have now been changed over to percentile. So 
if I have a strength of 12, previously my strength now is 60. It's pretty simple. You just, and you're still rolling your three dice, 3D6, I should say. And some are a little different, like education. You're usually going to have some sort of a bonus to that. Uh, size is really 2D6 plus 6. But all in all, you're just multiplying those traditional 3 to 18s by 5, and boom, there you go. And it makes life so much simpler. There is no resistance table anymore in Call of Cthulhu, and I know a lot of people are happy about that. So we're in combat. Combat is pretty easy. It is Combat in Call of Cthulhu is not overly crunchy. There are different things you can do. You can try to dodge. You can try to parry. Uh, usually parrying is, is uh, in melee, right? Physical combat. So there's, there's not a ton that you really have to know outside of, okay, so what is your skill in, in whatever combat uh, aspect? So maybe it's, you know, unarmed using your fists, or maybe it's with a, a knife, or maybe it's with a pistol or a rifle or a shotgun, what have you. All right, so I do want to mention you may be picking this up. I think you probably are. Pinky is down here. Pinky is one of our cats. She is down here in the duct tape studios today, and I think she's trying to make sure that everybody knows she's down here with us. So, Smokey, my cat, is also down here, but she's just sacked out. You never hear from Smokey, especially if you happen to watch the uh, live show that I do, The Daily Dope. You'll hear Pinky. You'll never see her. You never hear Smokey make any noise, but sometimes she will be sitting on my lap when I open the show. <laughs> so, all right. So, anyway, combat is very deadly, and it is pretty easy. And there is this flow chart that is included as well that makes things a lot simpler as well. It's pretty easy to go through. Once again, there have been some changes here to make the character's survivability a bit higher, which I like. I, I have no issue with that. I never have run Call of Cthulhu as a meat grinder even when I was ro running just a one-shot. Now, if I were rolling just kind of a one-shot adventure, I'm apt to, to just be pretty gruesome, <laughs> but I'm still not going to completely wipe everyone out. We do have new rules for chases. And I will mention that some people, I don't think they understand the rules to the chase. And this is like a mini game within Call of Cthulhu. I will say in all the years I've run the game, some of the most memorable action scenes that have taken place in all those years have been chases. So I like how this seventh edition has focused on how, to, I mean, the rules, you don't have to use them, right? You can toss them out. Use the whatever, you know, system you want, just basically rolling skills for successes, which do come into play here. But I do like the fact that we do have these new rules for chases, and it creates this mini game within the game. And it's pretty interesting. I know some people won't use them, and that's fine. Keep in mind, there are things in this edition that I'm, not like I'm like kind of like eh. so for an example you know the the hard difficulty and extreme difficulty and the thing is all the players have all these numbers written down on their character sheet so to me it makes the character sheets kind of messy so like I said I'm not super keen on that but I don't really have any issue with it once again seventh edition Call of Cthulhu you can easily port in just about anything from the first edition on in. We'll mention, though, because previous editions had some tweaks here and there. There weren't huge 
amounts of change that took place from edition to edition. I will mention, 7th edition, from my memory, and I, I'll be honest, I don't recall 4th edition Call of Cthulhu. I probably had it. <laughs> I'm just saying, I don't necessarily remember the 4th edition of it. But the 7th edition has a lot of changes. A lot of changes, a lot of streamlining, a lot of clarity. There's a lot more clarity to these rules as well. And one of the aspects that provides a lot more clarity is covering sanity. This is another kind of touchy area about Call of Cthulhu or really any Lovecraftian horror role-playing game. Sometimes mental illness, it, it, can be, it can be troubling for people to have to deal with in a game. Of course, in Lovecraft's stories, not not really uh, uh, not really presented <laughs> too well either. But then again, I think a lot of people don't realize in the twenties and thirties, somebody went to an asylum. They were not there for the most part. For most of them, I know some facilities really did focus on trying to treat the patients. Many. Uh, mental hospitals, sanitariums, whatever you want to call them, they, all they cared about was just locking people away. So that is something you got to keep your, keep your eyes on and kind of keep in mind as well. So, so mental health, dangerousness criteria, increasing your sanity points. So, of course, one of the mechanisms in Call of Cthulhu is your sanity. And as you see these, insane things that you didn't know existed in this world that have been hiding in the shadows or maybe in other dimensions, your mind rebels against it. So it's possible that you can, something can happen and your mind just says, oh no, I didn't really see that. <laughs> that wasn't, no, that wasn't, no, 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 no. But if you do really truly comprehend it, then you're you're mentally shaken so characters will gradually continue to lose sanity and you can be have temporary insanity you can have permanent insanity you can have a character just go completely insane and they're no longer a player character they're no longer part of the game that's one of the aspects of call of cthulhu i've always loved so we got magic. We actually have magic broken up into a couple of chapters, essentially. We have magic, and then we have dispel. So this talks about the various different uh, types of magic, using magic, learning spells, becoming a believer. But something else that's brand new with this, uh, as far as becoming a believer in, in like, oh my gosh, this stuff is real is much more helpful for you if you're trying to cast spells. But then again, it's not that helpful for you if you're trying to stay sane. So then we get into playing the game and this is just kind of just discussing, you know, how do you play it? I will mention that as a game master, a keeper, first time keepers, Call of Cthulhu is very, very different than other role playing games. For one, the investigators are pretty much, unless you're playing a pulp game, they're just regular people who are caught in these crazy, insane events. Here we go, good old Cthulhu, the statue of Cthulhu. So you've got that. I know a lot of role-playing games, the characters even starting off, they are, you know, heroic, big heroes. Not not in this game, like I said, unless you're playing pulp. You're just playing regular people. Now, these people have expertise. They're professionals. You, you could be playing parapsychologists or journalists or archaeologists. There's, like I said, in the investigator handbook, there are over 100 different occupations for the characters. 
So there is the discussion here. Talking about playing the game. One of the aspects of Call of Cthulhu that has been around since the first edition is, of course, finding clues, peeling the layers of the onion away so you can get to the center of what's really going on. And earlier editions, kind of, the adventures were set up where if if your player characters rolled poorly, say, for an example, when they were researching at a library or maybe they were at a newspaper and they were trying to go through the uh, the morgue, what they like to call the, uh, the, the old newspapers and the newspaper morgue, maybe they missed their roles, they didn't find a specific clue, then the adventure could kind of come screeching to a halt. Your, your campaign could just hit the brakes really hard and throw everybody for a, for a spin. That has been changed a little bit here in the 7th edition. Plus, keeping in mind, you also have the ability to push your roles, use luck to, to succeed, working together to get advantage. That's something that I didn't mention. If you're not familiar with advantage and disadvantage, in Call of Cthulhu, if you have advantage rolling your skill, you're going to roll an extra D10. And it's your 10 digit. So you're going to take the lowest of the two 10 digits. And basically, you've got advantage. So whatever is the lowest roll, so you're going to have one single digit die, and you'll have two tens digits. So, for an example, if you roll a 52 and a 32, you're going to take the 32. You're going to take the lower of the rolls. If you have disadvantage in that same situation, you would take the higher of the rolls. So, kind of talking about different themes in Lovecraft stories. Sometimes the keeper will make rolls for the player characters because a lot of times it's uh if they if they notice something or if they hear sometimes if they hear something sometimes as a keeper you don't necessarily want to say all right everybody I, I need you to all roll on your listen skill because that kind of takes away from you know the surprise if something happens right so a lot of times uh, the keeper will make rolls for the player characters. I know some people don't care for that much. It's never bothered any of my players because I just kind of throw it out there like, uh, you know, for an example, I'd say, oh, Elliot, my best friend, Elliot Miller, who has played in almost every game of Call of Cthulhu I've run. Uh, maybe his character hears something because I made his listen roll. I'll say, oh, you hear whatever, and it's just very natural. It's not I'm sitting there saying, okay, well, I rolled your listen skill for you. I rolled your spot hidden for you. That also means that your player characters can also sit there and call to make rolls, right? Okay, so uh, we're at the door here. I'm going to make a listen roll because I want to hear, see if I hear anything going on behind the door. I want to try to hear if somebody's in there in that room. So here we got the Tomes of Eldritch lore. One other aspect of Call of Cthulhu is all these ancient tomes that, that have all this mysterious knowledge. Also, reading these books affects your sanity. You lose sanity. It's like, oh my God! You can also learn spells from books. Depending on the adventure that you're playing, you might learn clues about what's going on by reading a tome that you might find. Many of these are going to be in languages that are not English. Or if you're playing Call of Cthulhu, say, in Germany, I assume like your characters are all speaking German, you might find things in, in Latin. You might find things in Chinese. Never know. So there is a good selection of Mythos Tomes. I do want to also mention that usually in adventures, you'll have uh, creator-made magic tomes as well. So 
So the author, the designer of that adventure will a lot of times create different books. All right, so as I mentioned, we're, we've got uh, this book is, uh, the spells are broken up in two sections here. The way I have always approached the spells in Call of Cthulhu is that the, the player characters, when they learn a spell, they have an idea of what it does. They may not know exactly what it does. One aspect I also like in 7th edition is we get different uh, options, different versions. We get different names for different spells. The spell's not always going to necessarily be called the same thing. There is a grimoire that is available, a separate Call of Cthulhu grimoire that collects just about every spell that has been released in all of the adventures over all of the decades for Call of Cthulhu. Now we get in artifacts and alien devices. There's the old Mego, one of my favorite Lovecraftian races. So just talking about different, uh, different items, different strangeness from various Lovecraft stories. The deep one. There's not a lot of that in there. Then we get into Monsters, Beasts, and Alien Gods. So we get uh, this kind of size comparison chart, which was also included in the Investigator Handbook. And I was kind of like, what? I, like, I, don't, I don't want my players to know about any of this stuff. So just kind of talking about some of these. It's mainly about uh, different creatures monsters that you might run across different uh, races as well there we go there's the migo the fun guy from you golf lots of pretty cool stuff in here the rat thing from uh the witch house dreams in the witch house the rat thing One aspect of Call of Cthulhu that is a bit different, especially if you're coming from, say, like a fantasy role-playing game, you're going to have monsters, but you're not going to have tons of monsters. Usually in a Call of Cthulhu adventure, you might go up against one specific sort of creature, or you may be going up against uh, a couple of different kinds. But you're not going to be... It's not like a D and D or Pathfinder adventure where it's you're going through the whole adventure and you've, you've taken on like a, you have dozens of different monsters in a dungeon that does not happen. Now we start getting into the, essentially the gods, the old ones. And usually in many call of Cthulhu adventures, your antagonists, your villains that you're going to take on are usually cultists. A lot of times they're cultists. They might be working in conjunction with some monsters or they might summon monsters, but they usually are worshiping these great old ones. And they're looking, they're trying to bring them back because I guess, you know, it's a little spoiler here. For those out there, it's first of all, this is a keeper rule book. So if you're a player and you've been watching this, I don't know what to tell you. But essentially, the whole Lovecraft Cthulhu mythos is that long before man evolved, these creatures, these things, these great old ones, these elder gods actually ruled the earth. And different things took place. That uh, so, for an example, like Great Cthulhu, Great Cthulhu lies sleeping in the city of Rai, or eh, some people pronounce it different ways. I always say Rai, sleeping, waiting to be, you know, reawakened to rise once again. Near Lothotep, another big baddie, who uh, actually is more like. Almost uh, strangely, if in most adventures, Nair Lothotep is is kind of a more like traditional villain, 
like Cthulhu is just super alien and weird. Nair Lothotep almost has human ambitions. Not to say that it's you you're gonna play that entity as like a mustache twirling villain or anything like that, because he's completely alien. But as an example, in uh the world famous massive Nair Lothotep campaign, which I love. I've I've run that twice. I would like to run it one more time. I would like to see the new edition. I have not seen the new edition of Massive Nair Lothotep. I'd love to do a review of it, actually. But anyway, um, the players will run across, will encounter kind of like avatars of Nair Lothotep. It's possible that they actually encounter Nair Lothotep, but not to, to battle him. Because one aspect of Call of Cthulhu that thankfully has changed over the years is the great old ones no longer have hit points, right? So it's like, okay, well, you know, Cthulhu's got 300 hit points and he's got an armor of five, so that absorbs five points of damage every time you hit him. I mean, it's silly. I mean, Cthulhu is supposed to be this giant entity which you would, you know, you'd probably have to drop a nuke on them, maybe. So then we get into the scenarios. We've got some interesting scenarios. Uh, uh, midst the Ancient Trees is an interesting introductory adventure. It is not designed to be super lethal, which is cool because you're running... Usually, you know, you're you're looking at it's a it's a new keeper. You've got new players are probably not very familiar with Call of Cthulhu and how different it is from other role playing games out there. And of course, they probably have heard, oh my gosh, all the characters get killed every adventure. And this is actually a nice link as well. This is not a single session adventure. This uh, this adventure. I would say he's probably going to take about three sessions to complete. Then we get handouts. Because Call of Cthulhu was famous for handouts. I honestly think it was the first role-playing game that really started to have, like, clues that you would give to your players. Yes, I know some of the old TSR modules did have little booklets that had images, had artwork in it. So it's like, oh, that's what that monster looks like, and you'd share it with the players. Call of Cthulhu, you've got clues. So people could be finding um, notes. They could be finding diaries. They could be finding those occult tomes. And usually the clues are going to show, like, like a particular block of text. They might find newspaper articles. They could be finding... Um, Oh my gosh, stuff at the library that could be going is through City Hall's records. So you you have an opportunity to share tons and tons of clues. Players might get a telegraph, <laughs> the telegram, I should say. And you can provide them with, you know, you create a telegraph, telegraph, telegram, Jeff. And uh give it, print it out, play it, give it to the players. So that just really does a really nice job of of immersing the players deeper into the adventure. I remember the box set of Masters of Nair Lothotep actually had a little matchbook, uh, matchbox, I should say, that you put together, and it was one of the clues that you found in this room. It's like, oh, wow. You, they can find photographs, all different stuff. So then we get into the appendices, get a little bit of glossary, we're going to get uh, our character sheets as well. Converting the 7th edition is actually very, very easily done. Oh, there's Pinky going on and on. She thinks she was being murdered down here. She's, just, she's actually complaining at the water. For some reason, she just yells at the water bowl. Sort of like, I don't know, she's like, get off my lawn. So we get equipment lists. Uh, there's much more detail about this kind of stuff in the investigator handbook. We get the weapons. I will say, in my opinion, 
of course, you must have this. You must have this book if if you are going to play Call of Cthulhu. You have to have the Keeper rule book. Could you get away with not having the Investigator handbook? I think you could. I do believe you should have the set of both, but in a pinch, you could play Call of Cthulhu just with this book itself. You won't have uh you won't have the access to all of those occupations. Of course, the book also has some good tips for players. Uh, also uh some pretty cool tips of the different characters that you should have in your group, which is also something a little different and also kind of in, in my opinion, inspired by say fifth edition D and D or even, you know, online games, you've got, you know, the person who's going to be your combat person. You got the person who's going to be kind of the one who's all about uh, mechanical items. You got somebody who's going to be, kind of your scientist. You've got somebody who's probably going to be your uh, your authority on, like, history, languages, things like that. So, actually, very good tips on that. This piece of artwork has been around since first edition. Right there. We got a summary of the sanity rules, summary of the magic rules. Eldritch Woods, quick reference chart for your half and fifth values. And your index. Got a cool map of Lovecraft country. We've got our 1920s investigator character sheet. And we got a modern era character sheet. You can play Call Cthulhu set in a variety of eras. Uh, the 20s and 30s are pretty much the traditional setting for Call of Cthulhu because that's when the stories are set. Uh, modern is very popular, but you could play in French Revolution. You could be playing World War II, World War I, ancient Rome, the near future, the far future. There are so many different aspects and eras that you can set Call of Cthulhu in. I have to say, I'm kind of surprised, if you're familiar with Lovecraft's work, I am a little surprised that we have not seen an updated Dreamlands book, and we haven't seen uh, Gaslamp, Cthulhu by Gaslamp, which is kind of Victorian era, and it's kind of set in England, mainly set in England. Kind of surprised we haven't seen those as of yet. Could be on the horizon. I do not know. All right. So what are my thoughts about the Keeper rule book? for 7th edition Call of Cthulhu, and let's give this a review score. Okay, so I mentioned there are a few things that I, I probably am not super keen on utilizing in the new edition. To me, I think the difficulty, the, you know, the half and then the fifth, for one, makes a very messy-looking character sheet. And I don't know. I mean, thankfully, in the skill descriptions that we we do get, okay, so a, a difficult, you know, a hard difficulty would usually be something along these lines, and extreme difficulty should be around these. So we get that. I'm just not necessarily completely sold on it. That said, it's a role-playing game. You can toss out whatever rules you really want and and add whatever you like. It's, it's written right in the rules. Use whatever you like in the book. And if you don't like something, toss it out or replace it with something else. So like I said, that, that's a little, to me, it's a little wonky. For some people, it's going to be perfect. And of course, with pushing your roles and having advantage and disadvantage, I guess that kind of makes up for the whole hard difficulty, extreme difficulty thing to try to, try to allow players an extra opportunity to possibly succeed or team up to tackle something, possibly get advantage, so on and so forth. I like the chase rules. I think the chase rules are very cool. They are a little tricky. I got to point out, they are a little tricky because you're kind of going through steps here and then it's like, 
okay, so how many steps ahead is the is the uh, the person being chased or the car or wh- whoever is being chased? And then you have to, you have the pursuer, and you're, you've got different speeds. There is a float chart for it too that really does help. But I do like the fact that some thought was given into chase scenes because there's so many of them that turn up in Call of Cthulhu Adventures. Never fails. A lot of times it's the characters running away from monsters. <laughs> so you've got that. Uh, I like the attention paid to the sanity rules. I love how that's been cleared up a bit because in past editions, sanity could be a little confusing. Carrot's been ironed out. Uh, I love the fact that we've got a lot of spells. We got a lot of monsters. We got a lot of gaming material packed into this book. I also appreciate the fact that you've got two adventures. One of the adventures is a pretty lengthy one. Usually when you have adventures that are included in a core rule book, which suddenly we seem to be getting fewer and fewer adventures in core rule books, but a lot of times when they are included, it's just a real quick introduction. Maybe you're going to get four hours game time out of it. That is not the case here in Amongst the Ancient Trees. So I am a huge fan of Call of Cthulhu. I have been a huge fan of Call of Cthulhu since the beginning. I do have just some minor quibbles, and it's just, it's not even like I have an issue with, oh, well, the design philosophy for this edition. I don't have that at all. It's not like, oh, my gosh, this is broken. It's just sort of like, I don't know if I want to run my adventures like that. So I can't really ding the book simply because maybe I disagree with an aspect of the the core rules for Call of Cthulhu. So on a scale of 1 to 10, get ready, strap yourself in. I give the Call of Cthulhu Keeper Rulebook a 10 out of 10. It is excellent. It is awesome. It is jam-packed with gaming material. I love that it's in full color. I love the full color artwork. I love how many things are clarified in this that have been a little confusing over the years. I definitely appreciate how the attributes are now percentile-based. We've gotten rid of that resistance table that threw a lot of people for a loop. So, and the player character's survivability is a bit higher now. Now, that's not to say your player characters do goofy things, but it's it's much more difficult for uh, clever investigators and investigators who are playing the game well to just be, you know, eliminated, which could happen in previous editions. So I do like that as well. I got to say, if you have any interest in Lovecraftian Cthulhu mythos role-playing, look no further. There's a reason why Call of Cthulhu has been the destination for Lovecraftian role-playing for decades. And this new Keeper Rule, well, I shouldn't say new, it's, it's new to me. This seventh edition Keeper Rulebook really does set the standard once again for the Cthulhu Mythos role-playing. All right, so that is it for today's Review page through. It's pretty long. Gosh, we went almost an hour. And I tell you, Pinky is driving me nuts. <laughs> She's just constant now. I think she wants something to eat. Anyway, if you like this video, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you do subscribe, ring that notification bell because it'll not only tell you when I upload videos like this review, I also tell you when the Daily Dope airs live Monday through Thursday nights right here on YouTube. And of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for 
for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more. And once again, I'm Jeff MacLear. I will see you next time. And as I like to close out, unfortunately, during this pandemic, please do your best to be smart and stay safe. Oh, you're still here. Well, if that's the case, by all means, subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel by clicking right here. And of course, if you want to catch up on past episodes of The Daily Dope, check out this playlist. And if you'd like to see what YouTube's recommending you take a peek at from the channel, just give a click right over here. Of course, I'm Jeff McAleer, and once again, thank you very much for watching.